Good morning, Mosaic family. It's Chris. Welcome to our 9 o'clock online service this morning. And we're going to get right to worshiping here. But just before we do that, just a couple of quick things. One, if you would like to grab the notes for Tony's sermon, you can grab those on, uh, at mosaicmansfield.com and at the Facebook page. Uh, so grab the notes so you can be ready for that. And also, just a heads up, if you didn't already see the video or kind of hear this, there will be communion later in the service. So if you've got a quick minute to uh, grab some elements that you have around the house and participate in that, you could do that or just kind of worshipfully, prayerfully participate with us when uh, Tony leads us through that later in the service. So it's good to have you this morning, and uh, thanks for joining us. I will uh, go ahead and say a quick prayer for us, and we'll worship together today. Father, thank you for a new morning and an opportunity to worship together. And while we're kind of bummed this morning that we're not together in person, uh, we're thankful that we can worship in this way and still be together and certainly in your presence. So um, we just come to you this morning and we open our, our, our hearts and our ears to you. And Lord, we want to worship you and, and hear from you and um, just thank you for being a loving father who is right here with us and leading and guiding us today and we uh we just look to you for that in jesus name amen
you uh, didn't catch right before we uh, started into worship, a few more of you may have joined. Just a couple of quick things. You can grab the notes for Tony's sermon from the website or the Facebook page to be prepared for the sermon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also, um, we will be having communion together later in the service. Tony will lead us through that with the team here. And uh, if you have a chance to to grab some elements from your around your house and join us for that, that would be awesome. A um, couple other things this morning. Um, you can remember you can always connect with us through the website mosaicmansfield.com. If you need to uh, contact us anyway, if you need to. Uh, give us a prayer request or to give online. Um, Facebook page, we've always got stuff going on there, so keep an eye on things, um, especially as things continue to change uh, around us moving forward. So, And in that, in that light, um, it's a bummer that we can't be together this morning indoors as we plan to have a 9 and a 10.50, uh, but because Richland County is at the level three red thing, we're just doing online moving forward. If we get back to uh, yellow or orange, level one or two, then we will move forward with our plans uh, for the 9 o'clock and the 1050 indoors. No RSVP, just come to church. And, uh, but if you're going to have children's, uh, children in the children's ministry classes and you'd like to pre-check them in to make sure you've got a spot because it is limited capacity, then keep that in mind uh, in the coming weeks. You can get on during the week and pre-check them in through the website. Same kind of RSVP system that we did in the past for that. Well, you can still just come to church and uh, bring the kids and it'll just be a first come first serve thing as many spots as we have um, last thing today in lieu of the usual fall festival that we do every year we're going to do another really fun thing that will uh, still be safe uh, but a, but a blast the drive through adventure on Saturday October 24th if you haven't heard about it if you haven't checked it out there's some stuff on the Facebook pages and uh, on the website uh, sign up for that as a family even do it with some friends or something it's going to be this massive scavenger hunt with an app that you use and you know around driving around the city and finding stuff and taking pics and um, you know you'll come to the church to get your info and everything it's going to be a blast I promise so um sign up for that you can do that anytime through the website um i think that's it this morning another quick prayer and then we'll get back to worship father thank you that your grace is enough this morning no matter what we have going on in our lives and no matter what is happening around us god your grace is enough that we can still have peace in our lives so we look to you our, our prince of peace this morning i just ask a blessing on every one of my brothers and sisters uh, my fellow broken pieces out there in our mosaic family that um, I just ask that you would bless them today that you would help them to um, to seek you and to find you today um, we ask for your continued protection for your healing where healing is needed and um, just your blessing as we continue to navigate um, so many shifting and changing things in our life thank you that you're our rock this morning we look to you and we ask that you would bless this service in Jesus' name, amen.
Father, I'm not even sure how to follow a song like that that speaks such vivid and real truth. Oh, Lord, that you would be, uh, that we would recognize that you and you alone are our good. You and you alone are our righteousness. You and you alone are God. And uh, you have seen fit for whatever reason, Lord Jesus, to give us life in you and, and um, to draw us to your, so you have made us the, the pinnacle of your creation, the crown jewel. And you have breathed your life into us. As we come to you, Lord God, now created in Christ Jesus, we just offer you ourselves today, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies, for you to accomplish your will, for you to be glorified, for us to see you in your, in your precious mercies. Uh, bless this time today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's well. Um, we um, have some things to do this morning. I'm very excited uh, to be able to just break, just get into the Word and spend some time being encouraged by, by uh, what it is that God has for us. You know, but the first thing we have to do, if I may is we need to pray for our nation, and we need to pray for our president and the first lady, and we need to pray for those um, who are, have been commissioned by you, by God, to establish, as he has established his government and those who govern. Uh, it is ours to pray for them, so if you would join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for the incredible privilege we have to bring those you have established, those you have arranged to govern over us, Lord God, we have the privilege of bringing them to you in prayer. And um, we pray, Lord Jesus, first and foremost for their healing, Lord God, as, as there are those who are, have been ill and, and contracted uh, sickness that could be, uh, that could be uh, certainly detrimental, Lord, we pray that you would, your healing hand would be there, wisdom for the doctors and the medical professionals that are that are ministering to them, Lord, and I pray for the, those that are in their surrounding circles, Lord God, uh, from, from the president right down every concentric circle out, Lord, we pray your hand in their lives and your will to be done. Lord, as a nation, we lift our, the entire nation up to you, Lord Jesus, that you would protect it and, and that we as your people, Lord God, would live here in such a way peaceably, graciously, kindly, lovingly, that, Lord, we would, um, we would bring blessing to our communities um, as we lift prayers to you and live our lives in reflection of Jesus. Um, and Lord God, we pray for the prosperity of this nation and meaning, Lord God, the prosperity of righteousness and wisdom, uh, goodness, justice. Lord Jesus, we lift those things to you and pray that those things would be done and that it would begin with us, your children, by your spirit, according to your truth that we would know what is right and just and fair in our own lives. And as we bring the kingdom forward into the lives of others, Lord Jesus, we would bring that rightness, that goodness, that fairness, and that justice. Remind us, Lord God, that all of that begins with each one of us in that process. And that, with that being said, though, Father, we do together lift up those you have chosen to govern us and pray that you would, you would bless them and keep them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, as uh, you may, may um, as you may th imagine, uh, it is a, you know I wish we could be together in person today, uh, but I, I am genuinely confident in God's ability to knit us together and to, uh, to 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 use this. This is listen. This is the epitome of God working out good for those all things for those who love Him and have been called to His purposes. That His body is one and it is united and it is knit together not only here in Mansfield or Richland County but around the world. Lord God, our we uh, our Lord uh, uh, just is working in us and through us, and he is putting us together as this beautiful mosaic. And so I want us to know, I want you to know that, uh, man, it would be great to see your lovely faces, but at least you get to see mine, so there you go. So here's the deal. What we want to do is we're going to continue in this, um, in this uh, study of First Peter that we uh, have begun, and uh, there are a couple things that I really want to look at today that I want to emphasize, uh, especially during these times. Uh, you know, when, when um, I mentioned this a couple times before, when God kind of put it on my heart to teach through First and Second Peter, and this was over a year ago now, I never imagined we would be in the times that we are. I just didn't. I didn't, I didn't think about it in these terms. Um, I didn't 
I didn't know what was coming, but it has been astounding to me how relevant it has been to each and every moment in which we've, uh, w- w- in which we've found ourselves in. And, and today's no different. Uh, there's, a, there's a phrase that I want to cling to just a little bit uh, that I hope um, I'm able to get through in, a, in, a, in a, an appropriate amount of time. If you do not have the notes and you have access to the notes, I would encourage you to get them now. There's a ton, ton, ton of stuff in the notes that will supplement and give encouragement uh, to what it is we're talking today, about today. So I'm going to start here. Says, you know, here's the truth. We are free. We are absolutely free in Christ. I love Galatians. If you read through Galatians and Paul is imploring this Gentile church of, of former pagans who are now children of God and that by grace, he has continued pushing them just to remind them to live in this grace that God has from them, to remain free of the law and the stringent nature of the law and to remain free of the consequence of sin. And so he's reminding them it is for freedom you've been set free. You are free indeed. Now live this life in freedom, not using your freedom to indulge the flesh, but using your freedom to serve others in love. So we are free, and we're no longer a slave of sin and death, but we are saved by Jesus' life and work, and we now live for him. We live in him. We live for him. And so as we are no longer dominated by sin, we instead enjoy the, the privilege of living with and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and that in line with the truth of God. And this through Jesus. Jesus conquered sin He conquered, took upon himself our condemnation, and he even released us from death and did all of this, dying for us. So God in Christ has now given me the ability in Christ Jesus and the empowerment to not only be free from the condemnation of sin and the fear of death, but also to choose to not live under sin's destructive influence and consequence here in this life, today, here in the now. So in Jesus, we can now participate in his divine nature. We, by his spirit, according to his truth, can live according to his nature. So here's what we can do in Christ Jesus. First of all, we can overcome the flesh. We do not have to live as a slave to the flesh and its desires. Sin is no longer my nature. It is no longer the essence of my spirit, my soul. Therefore, I can now, I, I, don't, I can say no to the flesh. Um, and being now righteous, my, you know, my, the deepest desire in my heart is to please God. And in that, now I can choose to act righteously. There is a righteousness in me that is the character and the formation of Christ in me. His grace has, has given me both righteousness and goodness. And now, having that nature in me, I'm choo- I can choose to live as Jesus lived. I can choose that. I can participate in this divine nature. And in that, as the Spirit has given me life, now my ambition can be to live out my faith and righteousness, that I can, I can be eager to do that and make it my ambition to do so. I can do this. And the desire of my heart and the goal of my living can be to please Christ and live according to his righteousness. Now, with all of that, I have this, this grace. Not only it has, has made all this to be so and given me life in Christ, but it also bleeds out into the, the circumstances of each day and the choices that I make. That if for whatever reason I choose to not live out my righteousness and what we call sin, here's how grace covers us. He is right and just and fair, according to 1 John, to forgive me when I confess my sins, that when, when I am afflicted, when, when the Holy Spirit convicts my soul and I recognize that I have, fallen, I have fallen short of that righteousness, when I have chosen to do otherwise, I come before him wanting to repair the relationship, to be effective in him. I ask forgiveness of those sins, and he restores me. He res- restores me to proximity with him, and he restores me to uh, effectiveness in him. So the reason I need to realize that is the battle between my flesh and my spirit continues to rage on. That does not go away. But I don't have to succumb to it. I don't have to succumb to the desires of my flesh. Instead, I get to listen to, to follow, and to walk in step with the Holy Spirit and live under his influence. I can do that. I can allow the Spirit to move in me and and, and, uh, to work in me. So turn to 1 Peter 4 with me real quick. And as you turn there, I'm going to pray, and then we'll go further. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray, Jesus, that it it would just continue to, to... run deep in our soul and it would transform us and change us and, and, and uh, knit us to you uh, more and more and more. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in First Peter. We're going to start at verse, uh, chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 2, actually. 
Uh, well, we'll start at first one, give it context. It says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, he says, arm yourself with the same attitude, in essence, as Jesus, because he who suffered in his body is finished with sin, done with it. We just read all of that. We just, we just recited all of it. The idea that now I, I, I am no longer a slave of sin. I, don't have to, I, I can be done with sin. I can, be, I can have my eyes open to its effect and despise what it does, and I can be finished with it. Verse two, as a result... Listen, when I'm done, when I, when I see what Jesus has, did, has done, how he suffered in his body, and that suffering had to do with the effect of sin on him, and then how he saw the effect of sin on his creation, he died on behalf of us and was, and, and was done with it. He nailed it to the cross, done with it. When we see that and we receive from him what he has for us, there are two things that result. Number one is we don't want anything to do with sin anymore. We hate sin. We hate the effect of sin. We hate the consequences of sin. That's number one. And then number two, we are now, listen, look at what it says. As a result, because of this, when we have the attitude of Christ, when we join him in his despising of sin, when we, we receive from him the grace and the power that he gives us to overcome sin, as a result, he does, this person does no longer lives the rest of his life, earthly life for evil human desires or to sin but rather for the will of God. So there's the resulting effect of this is this. As, as, I, as, as I come before God and he reveals his holiness to me and he calls me into a relationship with Christ and I receive what he offers and that's the forgiveness of sin and his character embedded in me, his Holy Spirit. I look at the world and I see sin and I see the effect of sin. I feel the effect of sin in a way that I didn't even before I was in Christ. And now I despise it. I hate it. I hate the effect of it both in my life and the lives of others. That causes me to no longer want to live for sin, but actually for righteousness. So what does that look like? I don't live for my fleshly desires anymore. I don't look for, for what the world has to offer me. I see the effect of sin. Instead, I desire now. The result is I want to live the rest of my life for Christ. I don't live for those human desires anymore, but rather the will of God accomplishing his will. His will in me released me from the, from. from the condemnation of sin and death released me from fear, released me from the ultimate consequence of sin, which is, which is separation from him, drew me into a relationship with him, and then embraces me, fills me with his spirit, and causes me to be able to walk with him, have the joy of knowing that everything that Christ has done and everything that he is is mine. He has given it to me by grace, just because I've trusted in him. So therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, we're to arm ourselves with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in, sin, uh, in, in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live anymore for those things, but instead for the will of God. And he goes on to say, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what, what you did when you were a sinner. Go on to verse 4. And, and in, in, in having changed your life, those who you used to sin with now look at you and think it's strange that you don't want to join them anymore in what they're doing. What should break our hearts in that moment, we've said it before, is that these people who we used to be like, who we used to live with, who we used to practice sin with, and now we see and they, they look at us as though something strange is going on, they have to give an account to God. And it is ours to bring in the rescuing nature of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus, and, to, and, to, and offer them, uh, as Jesus offers them, the kingdom through us. This is really, really important. Um, we, this is awesome. So in all of this, this is what I want to say. First of all, we are no longer slaves to, to our flesh or the sin. Therefore, we don't, have to make, we don't have to make decisions according to that. We have it in us now to be guided, prompted and guided by, by God to allow his spirit to direct us and to, to live according to his will. We have that now. We have it. By the Spirit of God, we can do his will. And that is what brings life and true peace and joy and satisfaction it gives us a new and renewed vision and ambition for life. And this posture sets my eyes above. Right on Jesus and his desire, uh, his desire for my life in this world. So now I can live with and see, I can live with and see life in others with the same attitude Jesus did. So this is what I want to do real quick. I want to go to John 13 for a moment. 
So turn back to John 13, it's um, back a few books. And what I want to do is I want, to see, I want us to see the confidence that Jesus had to be able to live and how we can now live like him. But it has to do first and, for, first and foremost with our mindset. So here we see, oops, so here we see Peter. Peter is saying to us, man, we have to, have, what, when in Christ Jesus we need to see that he suffered in his body and that, that suffering was the effect of sin. In fact, even becoming sin and taking it, taking it to the cross and suffering death. We are to arm ourselves with the same attitude he had regarding sin, despising it, allowed it to be, took it to the cross to be crucified. And therefore, we no longer live for sin, but seeing its effect, we now live for Christ Jesus and his will. But there's there's a mindset that gives us confidence. So so when Peter uses the word attitude, arm yourself with the same attitude as Jesus. I want to show us, I want us to see where Jesus' attitude was anchored. We need to understand that's a mindset, it's a thought process. It's the, an attitude is a direction of thinking, a way of thinking. So go to John 13, and what, it's one of the places Jesus most, it, that, as it describes Jesus, it most succinctly uh, reveals to us what his motivation is, what his attitude was, and where it was rooted. So here it is in verse 13. So it says, it was just before the Passover feast. Look at what it says next. It says, Jesus knew that, his time, that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, we're going to look at a, a, a little phrase in a moment that relates to this. When Peter says, the end is near, the end is nigh, the, the, all things are, being, are ready to come to, com, to, to completion. And that relates directly to this phrase. Look what it says. It says, it was just before the Passover feast. So Jesus has gathered his disciples up. This is the beginning of the, of the Passover feast. It would be the Last Supper, the thing we're going to celebrate even today. He says, it was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew. This is really important. Jesus knew. This word knew means he knew confidently. There was no doubt in his mind. This is something he knew as truth. Look what it says. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world. In other words, what, what was happening was his earthly life and ministry was coming to an end. Now, what I want us to understand is this. He saw this in light of everything that he was call, came here to accomplish, according to his Father's will, that he came as a person. He suffered as we suffered. From the time he came, to te- from the time he was born to the time of the beginning of his ministry, he lived and grew and worked and grew in maturity and stature just like we do. He had to learn to be obedient to his parents. Go back and look at Luke, ch- Luke chapters two through four. This idea of Jesus coming into his own was his living just like us in the midst of suffering. If you look at Hebrews, it says that he suffered just as we have suffered. That, that if his brothers and sisters have flesh and blood, so their savior, their brother would also have flesh and blood and they would suffer in the same way, even though he didn't sin. So what I want us to see is this. And when it says, it, just before the Passover, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world. What it is, is the closing of a chapter. That each part of his life was like a chapter to be read. And as that chapter is closed, it didn't mean it went away. It meant that the next chapter stems from the previous chapter. And each chapter builds into the next. And this is God's revealing of self and it's Jesus' experience with us. And so as he's coming, to, as this is all coming to, 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 uh, to a head, he's bringing his disciples together and he is, he is finishing his ministry. He's finishing what he came to do here on earth as, while he walked in the flesh. So it was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. In other words, he recognized that the purpose for which he was sent was being accomplished. It was being finished. And it was coming to an end. It was coming to a conclusion. This chapter was closing. We need to recognize that that's how God reveals himself to us. And that's also how we live. So he says, it was just before the Passover feast, verse 1, Jesus knew the time he had come. The time, for him, the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, that's the beginning of the attitude. It's the recognition that Jesus knew the Father and knew why he came, knew why he was here. Well, we need to do the same. Why are we here? We are children of the Father through, by, through faith in Jesus Christ. Now indwelled by the Holy Spirit, we walk here to be an expression of God's grace to a dying world. That is our role, that is our privilege, that is our honor to be ambassadors of God. That is why we're here. And there will be a moment 
when, it, it, when, when the chapter begins to close and we are taken to the Father. And so this confidence, this knowledge and this confidence are crucial to having the same attitude as Jesus as we look at sin. So he says it is just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Look what it says next. Having loved his own who were in the world, having loved those who, uh, with whom God caused him, his father caused him to walk, those who were drawn to him, those in his sphere, those to, with whom he would have effect. Again, no different than here on earth for us. We have concentric circles of people in our lives that God has ordained and orchestrated for us to have an effect on for us to live among, for us to bring the person of Christ into him, for them to bring him into us. We, this is the attitude that we have to have. This is, the, this is the perspective. This is the point of view. This is how God would have us look at our world, that we are here for a purpose, just as Christ came for a purpose and he lived out that purpose according, and, and accomplished God's will and recognized that that chapter would be folded up and finished, certainly to lead to another chapter. So it is with us. How are we looking at our world? Peter calls us strangers and aliens. We are called ambassadors. We are priests, a holy priesthood, offering sacrifices to God. Paul says that means we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, to be used by God here in life today, here in the now. That's what he calls us to. Is that our mindset? Do we understand that? And Jesus, if, so Peter is saying, have the same attitude as Jesus. Jesus said, this is where my attitude begins. I know why I'm here. I know it was for a short time. And I know accomplishing what the Father sent me to accomplish, this portion of it would come to an end, and I'm ready for it. I am prepared for it. I have it in mind. And my actions, listen, my actions reflect this knowledge. We're going to get to that in a minute. So it's just before the, the, before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world. This chapter was coming to close and that he would go to his father. This is a measure of faith and confidence. Look what it says next. Having loved his own who were in the world, having done what the father had sent him to do, to gather up those who would, in this case, and in our case, would, would now extend the kingdom of heaven out, having loved those who were in the world. He now showed them, listen, the full extent of his love. He loved them to the end. Think about that for a minute. He now, knowing this truth of who he, was, who he is, why he was here, the length that the time he would be here would be short, that there was a, there was a purpose for which he was, he was sent here and a will to accomplish and that of his father. He had come to the end of that, chapter after chapter after chapter, and as this chapter unfolded and he was working through the pages of this moment, he did this. He saw where he had come from, to whom he was going, and he, and he emptied himself on behalf of those he loved. These, this, so listen, look what it says. It says now, it says it was before the Passover feast and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father and having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He now expressed to them his love in a way that he had never expressed it before. He took everything that he had done, everything that he had said, everything that he had taught, everything that he had commanded and he, he just put, brought it into this dense ball of, of, of love right here in this moment and he said, I'm gonna show you now everything you've heard me say, everything, every time I've taught you, rebuked you, corrected you, instructed you, encouraged you, affirmed you. Every time you saw me work with something, every time you saw me touch something, every time I'm going to take all that and, and just compress it into a ball and I'm going to show you the extent of my love. Why could he do this? Because of his attitude, his perspective, where his eyes were set and the, and the confidence of the, in the knowledge of who he was, wh why he had come and where he was going. And we have that in us. What did he do to show the extent of his love? Listen to me. The end was near, it was imminent. We're gonna see that word again here in a moment. It was imminent, it was, on, it, was, it was on top of him. He felt the weight of it. Later, after this meal, you would see him pray in the garden and, it, and the, weight of this, the weight of this moment would be so heavy he would, he would sweat blood. He would ask his father, is there any way for this cup to pass me by? It was coming down on him, his end was imminent and yet he remained steadfast because he knew whose he was, he knew why he was here and he knew where he was going and now he could empty himself being full of the father. So look what it says now. It says this evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas to do what he was going to do. 
to betray Jesus. Verse three, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things, look at this, Jesus knew and was confident that he had put all things under his power. So not only now am I to have the same attitude and Jesus is recognizing I've been, I was made in the image of man, and that, or made, made in the image of God, and then created in Christ Jesus, and in being created in Christ Jesus, I'm filled with his spirit, and being filled with his spirit, I have a purpose here on earth, and that purpose is to be filled with him and to bring the kingdom forward, and I, and, and I can trust that God is going to do this and to bring me to its end, and in the meantime, I live a life that reflects the righteousness and the goodness of Jesus, and there's going to be a moment in time where Peter says, the end is near, and I'm going to, I'm, it's just going to, just life is going to, I need to let life out. I need now to show those, the spheres of influence that I have, I need to be able to show them the extent of my love. This is the attitude of Jesus. When he saw the effect of sin, the, he, he was taking it upon himself, and, and the end was coming. It was imminent. So what did he do? Being imminent, Jesus knew he was going to show them the extent of his love. Near the end, he realized it, and he was going to show them the extent of his love. He, it, this was one of his last opportunities to display to the disciples what it is to love like the kingdom. He's going to take this moment... According to Ephesians, he's going he's to make the most of this opportunity. He's going to look at it through, through his Father's lens, and he's going to make the most of it. So Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He was confident of his destiny. Confident. So, because he was confident, he took this attitude. He got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel and ra- that was wrapped around them. I'm going to stop here, and I want us to think about the process he just went through. He, I'm sure, reflected on his three and, three and a half years. Of, I'm sure he reflected on his family and being the son of Joseph and having his father passed, at least by tradition and having to walk beside his mother and run the carpenter, carpenter's business and to help raise his siblings, his commemoration into ministry and what it was to grow up through all this, to grow in maturity, to learn to be obedient to his parents, to grow in stature. He was thinking about everything that he had said to his disciples, everything that he had done. I could imagine him having just snapshots in mind of all the people that he's touched and all the people that were healed and every, every parable that he told. And a confident that he had accomplished everything the Father had sent him for. He sees that the end is near, it's imminent. And he chooses this moment to to show his disciples the extent of his love. He's gonna make the most of this opportunity. And I love how deliberately John describes Jesus' intent. It says the meal was being served, and it says that Jesus got up from the table, and what did he do? He went step by step by step, the act of a servant. Look Look what he does. Look at verse four. After reminding himself that he was of the Father, here to accomplish his will, after reminding himself that the time was nigh, it was coming to an end, that, his, that everything was imminent in regard to this being fulfilled. He reminded himself that he came from the Father, that that's where his life comes from, and that he was returning to the Father, that his Father would not leave him in the grave, but instead would bring him. What did he do? It says he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. So I want us to imagine the movements of Jesus as the meal was commencing. I want us to imagine him getting up from the table as the disciples were chatting and talking and they were looking forward to the meal and what was to come. Jesus would quietly get up, he would go to the corner of the room, and he would do what? He would begin to peel off an outer garment. As he's reciting in his mind everything that he's been through, as he's reminding himself of whose will he came to accomplish, as he's reminding himself of the life that has been lived and that, is, and, that, and that everything he came to do is now being finished and that the end is imminent. He's reminding himself that he came from the Father and the glory that he had while he was there. He's reminding himself of the life of the dust that is now on his feet and the calluses on his hand and what is to come. He's reminding himself of the confidence he has that his Father will not let him decay in the grave but will raise him up. He's reminding himself of the joy that is set before him that would cause him to endure the cross. He's reminding himself of everything that's going to come crashing down on him. He's reminding himself. And while he's doing that, he's peeling off an outer layer. He's pe- almost as if he knows that his physical body is going away. And he puts the towel of a, of a servant around his waist. And then what does he do? He then pours water into a basin. 
And I can Im- imagine him now hearing the water trickle into the basin, and he hears the waters of baptism as John is dunking him under the water. I can imagine him as that, as that, as that water is, is bubbling and, 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 and moving in the bowl and sloshes around. He remembers getting up out of the water and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Father through the Holy Spirit, say, this is my son of whom I'm so pleased <laughs> Can you imagine what was in the heart of him as the end was near, as things were coming to its completion? And he wraps the towel around his wife and he pours the water in a basin and he carries the basin over and he kneels at the feet of his disciples. And this is the extent of his love. Because the end was near, he took advantage of each and every opportunity. This is what, and who argued with him? Who argued with him? Look at the next verse. Verse six. And first he came to Simon Peter who said to him, are you going to wash my feet? Who argued with him? You're not gonna wash my feet. If you didn't know. Whose letter are we studying now? Peter's. What is Peter thinking about as he begins to talk about the attitude of Jesus as everything comes to an end? Who do you think he's thinking about when in a moment we'll read and the end is near, the end is imminent, it is coming, therefore love. What do you think he's thinking about? I can imagine Peter writing this down in his older age, reflecting on this moment when Jesus, when he is somehow caught out of the corner of his eye, Jesus over here disrobing and putting a towel, and then beginning to kneel at his feet and grabbing his foot as to wash it, and for him to draw it back and say no. And what Jesus said to him, if you want to be a part of me. I can imagine the pangs of, of, of guilt and shame and then, and then remembrance and pain and then, and then everything that Peter must have been going through as he's penning these words, as he's thinking back over time, as he's looking at the person of Jesus kneeling before him, the time being short, coming to a close, the chapter. Turn back to First Peter with me if you would. So as the end of Jesus' earthly ministry drew to a close, he remembered his father, he remembered his father's promise, he remembered his relationship and his role with, with a humility strengthened and emboldened by this truth. He knelt before the father entrusting himself and his welfare to him, and then having done that, he now knelt before the feet of each disciple, assured of who and whose he was, where and from whom he'd come, and confident to where and to whom he was going. With no fear of condemnation, no fear of loss of dignity, he gave himself, he emptied himself. He gave up his dignity and he served lovingly, showing the full extent of his love and he did it through humility. A humility that was fueled by, that was emboldened by this confident knowledge, this attitude that Jesus had. And we are to have that same attitude. Go to verse seven if you would. What does it say here? Peter. Oh, can you imagine? As he's penning this, as he's writing to the, to the saints scattered abroad, to those who are in the midst of suffering themselves, as he's trying to encourage them to, that everything that they're suffering is actually allowing Jesus to be revealed in them and it's proving their faith genuine. Don't lose it, hold on tight, because every time you persevere a suffering, it's proving that your faith is genuine, that that which God has given you is not going anywhere. And reminding them that you, you, have, you have been, you, you used to be nothing. You were not a people, but now you are a people. You are a holy priesthood. You are, you are living stones being connected to the cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus. You are a holy nation, a possession of God. Don't forget this. Through all the suffering, don't forget. I know life is hard in this country. I know life is hard at your work. I know life is hard in your family. I know it. I know. But don't give up. Don't. Your faith is real. It's being proven genuine. Remember, Jesus himself suffered in the body. And in suffering in the body, he was finished with sin. And so you can be too. Be done with it. Be done with it. Hate even the stained clothes of sin. And maybe that's why Jesus peeled off that robe. That the dust of the sin of the world had adulterated and he pulled it away. Hating, hating the effect of sin. 
We go to verse seven now, it says this. It says the end of all things. This is Peter now. What does he say? The end of all things is near. It is imminent. It is coming. The end. Now, what does he mean by the end? Well, there's lots of things he could mean by the end, but primarily what he means is this time is coming to a close. The will of God is being accomplished. And as it is accomplished, you need to recognize that it is imminent and it's coming and it's imminent and it's God's will that it happen. Now, we can look at this on the cosmic or the, or the macro view and the idea that, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Everyone, every century, everyone thinks the end is nigh. Well, it is. It's going to come in the blink of an eye. We don't know when that's going to happen. And when it comes, it's going to happen like bang. And there's tons of extra reading in here I want you to go look at uh, to be able to supplement this and to give yourself encouragement and hope and joy. But I've said before, the end also has to do with the fact that we have a limited time here on this earth, each one of us. And as each one of our chapters come to a close, it is ours to recognize the, the, the finality of life and that we are finite and that there is a moment in time when the Father brings us home. And it's our recognition of the time being short that causes us to, what, act wisely to be able to love the concentric circles God has brought around us and listen, to show them the full extent of our love because we realize this is why we came. And it is from the Father we have received life and it's to the Father that we're gonna go. That was Jesus, that was the root of Jesus' attitude toward life and toward service and toward loving and even toward death, toward the end, toward all things being imminent. We need to have, what did Paul Peter say here? He says you have to have the same attitude as Jesus did. Paul says the same thing in Philippians. So he says the end of all things is near. Now, I want to work down the notes here real quick. It means it's imminent. But there's something I want us to understand. This need not alarm us and it need not trouble us. You know, and, and, and right after this happens, they have the meal and Jesus is now telling the disciples what's going to happen next. One of the things he says is, listen, listen to me. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't. He said, I have overcome the world. I have, had, I have victory over this, and I will give you this same victory. Don't be, I know you are sad. I know you are grieved. It's okay. Don't be troubled. I know I've said these things. Don't be, do not let your heart be troubled. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And he reminds the disciples that. If you want to go back to John 14 at some point, go take a look at that. Romans 8, 1 Thessalonians 5. So... When we see these words, the end of all things is near, that could cause us to have trepidation or fear. It could cause us to be anxious. It could cause us to, uh, to think, man, I don't want to go yet. And all those things are natural things. Even Jesus spoke from a troubled heart. And he said to his disciples, don't be troubled. Why? Because they were. So there will, this will come. But we need to remind ourselves again, where is our life from? From whom? Have we gained life? And to whom do we go when this time is over? And what is it that we are called to accomplish in the meantime? And that the end is imminent, and that, Im- that imminent end will come at a time that we do not know. Therefore, live as if the time is imminent. That's what Peter is saying here. Don't let it alarm you. Don't let it trouble you. When it does come to me, remember me. Again, remember the Father. Remember what I said to you. I have overcome this world. Remember Remember where you're going when all this is over. I promise you, if I've gone to make a place for you, I promise you I'll come back and I will bring you to it. I want you to see. He, said, he prayed to his father. I want them to see the glory I had before when I was with you. Now, there's a verse to help us with this. Psalm 90.12 says this. The reality of these times we need to recognize and that each part of our life is a chapter and each chapter builds on the next. And as one chapter closes, a new chapter opens. And one of those chapters is eternity. And we can have hope in that. We can have joy in that. We look forward to that and we can be encouraged by that. So in the meantime, this is what we need to pray. Look at Psalm 90 verse 12. It says, teach us, listen, this is the psalmist saying, teach us to number our days or to see the number of our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now that's what the NIV says, but there, it's wonderfully said in about four other translations. So let me, let me repeat that over in a couple different ways. So again, the NIV says, teach us the number of our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom, that we may make the most of opportunity, uh, that we may see the moment for what it is and take full advantage of it, just like Jesus did. I'm gonna show you the extent of my love. Why? Because the time is right. And I'm gonna take everything I've ever experienced with you 
you and I'm going to... So listen, it says, so teach us the number of our days that we may gain wisdom. The, the uh, New American says, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. The New King James says it this way, teach us the number of our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The, the Old King James says that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, that we may grow. Another translation says, teach us to consider our mortality so that we might live wisely. We would take every moment and treat it as it deserves. And another uh, translation says, teach us to use wisely all the time that we have, every moment. And again, Ephesians 5, 6, 15 and 16 talk, t- teaches us how to make the most of every opportunity. As we know the numbers of our days are, the time is imminent, the end is near. We live in such a way as to recognize that we have very few days here and we take advantage of each moment. We act, we grow in wisdom, we act in wisdom. This should do a couple things for us. It should, and instead, it should alleviate our anxiety and our fear and it should actually inspire me to anticipate cheerfully what's to come. And even look at each moment as being this joyful moment of bringing the kingdom forward. And in that, it should embolden me to act. It should cause me to act without fear, to just love without any sense of need from anyone else, knowing it is from the Father I have been given life in Christ, it is by his spirit that I live, and it's to the Father that I'm going, and the time is short. So Peter calls us to be alert and sober, to be aware of these times, to be aware of the limits, to be aware of the shortness of time. And that enables us to gain a keen awareness of what's at hand. And then we're to be sober, circumspect, circumspect, being able to to take a step back and take into consideration what it is we're experiencing and and allow the urgency of the moment to actually grow in wisdom as as we move prudently. And all of this will lead us to prayer. All of us should lead us to every circumstance, every opportunity, every, every encounter, every engagement, every concentric circle that we're a part of, knowing that the time is imminent, imminent, realizing it is from God we gain life, it is by his spirit that we live, and it is to him we are going in Christ. I now look at this moment and I go, Father, how, what would you have me do in this? How would you have me show this person right now the extent of your love? How do I do it? What should I do? And now we can be directed by the spirit to do so. See, this is the art of being present, present with God and present with others and knowing the ultimate outcome. We need not be distracted. Knowing where we're going, we don't have to worry about that, but instead we can now live our life with a right perspective, perspective, a proper priority, and good practice. Good practice. Go to verse eight with me for a minute. Go to verse eight. He says, the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Be confident. Look at verse eight. Above all, now more than anything else, he says, nothing is more important than this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. Love brings people to repentance. Love covers one and and protects their dignity as they work through. Love enables you to walk with someone despite their sinfulness and to guide them, to walk with them in such a way as to guide them toward righteousness. Love does that. Deeply, sincerely, committedly, from the heart, love covers sin. It says offer hospitality to one another. Don't, don't, don't push, pe- pe- keep people at arm's length. Don't hold grudges. Don't, don't, don't deny them of, of, of the resources and the blessing that God has given you. But instead, offer it to them without any complaint, without any grumbling. He goes on in verse 10 to say, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in all its various forms. If we speak the truth, may we speak as though we have the very words of God. And if we serve, may we serve with such strength because it's God's strength that, that, that provides our ability. And this should happen so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, that it would bring him glory forever and ever, he says, as time begins to come to an end and we move into eternity. God is glorified and honored forever. If the band would get in place, we're going to get ready for communion. But I've got a couple things that I want to say as they prepare. This is both the reason, there, this is both the reason to not fear and a remedy for the times. Because these times can bring fear. 
Remember, Jesus had to say to his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled because his disciples' hearts were troubled. These moments bring the natural heart trouble, the natural mind anxiety. And Peter is saying, listen, you want the remedy for that? have the same attitude as Jesus towards sin and hate it, recognizing its effect, and then know that you have been given life through Christ, life in God through Christ. You live by the Spirit and you're returning to the Father. And these days are short. So now take the most, make the most of every opportunity. So let me say these things. If you are prone to anxiety and fear, especially in these times, or especially as the time comes comes is is coming, you know, just kind of ebbing and and fading into fading into to black. If you are prone to anxiety and fear, especially due to the times, it is essential that you take into account Peter's admonition here and that we need that we need not be afraid. We need not fear what others fear. We should not call conspiracy what other people call conspiracy. We know who Christ Jesus is. We know what he's about. The last chapter is written, we can have confidence and walk in him. The fact is the, the fact is this. Jesus has declared that he would return. And in the meantime, we are to live a life confident of him, of who we are in him, and live according to these saving graces. And we can live a life of love because these graces both saved us and continue to save us. Therefore, Peter gives us a remedy for anxiety. First, of course, is to just remember whose we are and who we are. And that Jesus has given us eternal life through him. But on top of that, we are to now live as though live this life as Jesus did. So one thing that should allay our fear is we know from, where, from whom our life comes, we know who, who holds our life now, and we know where we're going. And he has warned us, the time is short, so make the most of this opportunity. Grow in wisdom. But we can be confident in him. We can overcome our struggles in part by living and loving with a focus on the needs of others. So number one is to remember whose we are and who we are, where we've come from and where we're going. And next is in the meantime, let's put our attention on other things. We can over own, uh, overcome our own struggles in part by living and loving with a focus on the needs of others, loving others as we have been loved. There is something to be said about turning our, turning our eyes from our own anxieties, our own fears, and our own troubles, and then placing, them in the, placing those in the hand of the Father, and in turn, turning our attention to the hearts of others and their needs. Peter knows this. Peter is saying to us, I know how we're made. I'm one of us. <laughs> Trust Jesus. I had to learn how to, too. No. It is through the, from the Father our life comes in Christ Jesus is by his spirit that we live now and, he, and he, Jesus has promised us that he, he will come back and get us to bring us home. Now, this is what he, Peter's saying, this is what I would have you do. I would have you love one another. Show them the, having my attitude, my mindset, following my footsteps, now you show you, your concentric circles, your world of impact, the extent of your love or my love in you to you and through you. We're gonna get ready for communion. And uh, what we're gonna do is sing a song. And in the midst of the singing, I would challenge each one of us to take into consideration what it is, who it is we are in Christ Jesus, to really think through what it is to have been offered life eternal, the forgiveness of our sins, life in him, that we know where our life comes from. We have his life in us, and he has promised to come and get us, so we know where our life is going. We know where we're going. In the meantime, may we, in our circles, confident of that, reminding ourselves of that, strip ourselves of the, of the fleshly desires, strip ourselves of all those things that are of this world, and put the towel of servitude around our waist, and may we now bring a basin to our loved ones and wash their feet. May we imitate Jesus in all that he did, showing the full extent of our love. So as we sing, be thinking of such things.
imminent, <clears throat> being short, the end. Um, Jesus showed his disciples the extent of his love, confident of where he came from, confident in where he was going, living with the wisdom of knowing that the days were short, making the most of every opportunity. Jesus disrobed himself. Wrapped a servant's towel around his waist. Knelt at the feet of each disciple. And in doing so, showed, even in this moment, with the sin of the world crashing down on him, the weight of the world beginning to rest on his shoulders, in this moment, in this moment troubled in heart, wrestling with his Father's will in this moment. In this moment, Jesus chose to show the extent of his love. Then as he ate the meal, 
after demonstrating this, after having expressed this love, under the weight of what was to come. It says that Jesus, during the meal, took a piece of bread. It says that he broke it, and he handed it to his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, you remember me. It says after the meal he took a cup. He said this cup right here, this is a cup of a new covenant made in my blood. A new promise from the Father to you through me. A cup and a covenant that tells you from whom your life comes, by whom you live, and to whom you will go. A cup that says this day These days are short, they're numbered. And the blood that flows through you now is life. But the spirit that flows in you now is life eternal. And you have hope. And as you follow me, now you do what I've done. And you show the extent of your love as I have shown you mine. This is the cup of a new covenant made in my blood, given for you. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Before we sing, I want to read one more passage in regard to what it is what it looks like when we trust this truth and when we live according to knowing the days are short but we are confident who is life, who has given us life and where we are going. This is 1 Thessalonians 5. It says the day of the Lord. It says now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief of the ni- in the night. While people are, people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness, so that that's, this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting, a fa- putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. And so he gives his final instructions as to how we should live with this knowledge, to live in this confidence, to live with this hope, to live. Verse 12 says this, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold out, hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May, you, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter written, read to all the brothers and sisters, that they might be encouraged and let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a song. the 
for joining us this morning stay tuned here uh in the coming week we'll keep you posted on what's going to be happening but as soon as we can get back to that yellow or orange level one or two uh just remember we'll we'll be trying to get back in here for the nine o'clock and ten fifty services with no rsvp um pre-check-in for kids i mentioned all that earlier in the announcements but stay tuned we'll keep you posted um and then the other thing just as we wrap up today remember the drive through adventure uh, big scavenger hunt versus the rest of the Mosaic family. Um, sign up for that because it's coming up October 24th. You can do that through the website. Have an awesome week. Thanks for joining us. Grace and peace, my friends.